everyone, and welcome to another amazing episode of The Joy of Being for busy working moms and women in business and beyond who are seeking to unplug from their worries and overwhelm to light up with insight and joy. I, your host, mom, and effortless lifestyle coach, Marina Pearson, talk to transformational professionals, business owners, and creatives about what it really takes to have a business and life you can truly enjoy. And remember, you can find me on Instagram at Marina Pearson or my Facebook group, The Joy of Being. And if you'd like a more personalized touch to live a stress-free life, then why not find out more about The Joy of Being Retreat, an intimate four-day profound experience at a luxury venue in Javier, Spain, where you get to experience your inner calm and peace of mind by slowing down and making space. To find out more, email me at marina, marinapearson.com with Joy of Being Retreat in the title. And on today's show, we have the lovely Ruth Douglas. She is the founder, entrepreneur, and single parent of Imp Ideas. She helps businesses grow to master their marketing through authentic brand storytelling and community building. In 2012, she founded Eroticon, the conference for sex bloggers and erotica writers. The event proved to be life-changing for Ruth and many of the attendees. As the first time an event allowed her hitherto hidden community to meet, learn and grow. After five years and six events, Ruth sold that conference and now uses her experience to help entrepreneurs grow their business through marketing. And what I loved about our conversation with Ruth was the authenticity and rawness of what it is to live a life without the guilt. To be able to be a single parent and actually live making decisions that are based on something other than guilt. We talked about her life, we talked about some experiences that she was having with her daughter, and all in all, it was really to show you and illustrate that it is possible to be a mum, to have a business, and actually live your life without the guilt getting in the way so that you can actually have more freedom. So if you do experience guilt, if you do experience shame, if you do experience that and it's really crippling you in a way or stopping you from having a life that is connected, a life that is full of joy, then please join us today. Until the next time. So welcome, Ruth. I'm super excited to have you on this podcast here today, like I am with all of the guests. And uh, today we're going to be talking about guilt. Now, funnily enough, um, the way that Ruth and I met was just because I was looking for specific mums who, well, mums who basically had been on a journey from, you know, overwhelm and so forth and so on. And 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 I put a post out in a, a Facebook group and. Ruth and I had a brief conversation over over chat, and she's just yeah. I just really loved her story, so here she is. Hi, Ruth. Hi, Marina. How are you? I'm good, thank you. So, I I'm curious about your journey with 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 guilt, and obviously you're a mum and you run your own business, and yeah. So, yeah, I, I um. I suppose what struck me from your conversation when you put your little post out in um, in, our, in the Facebook group we share is the assumption that we would have guilt as parents, as specifically as working parents, and it's it struck a chord with me because it's a conversation that I've had with other parents, um, perhaps not explicitly around guilt but around decision making and second guessing yourself and worrying a lot about am I making the right decision if I do this does how does it affect the other and that kind of that second guessing that goes which is a part of feeling guilty that oh if if I choose make this choice over here there's going there's necessarily an impact that's going to make me feel guilty somehow um and I I don't really think like that. <laughs> um, so I'm always kind of intrigued that there's an assumption that as working parents or as parents that we feel guilty when we're making decisions, that there's always a negative payoff. Um, and I think a part of that reason why I don't think like that is because I've 
I'm a single parent is a big factor in that. I suppose I might feel like that if I wasn't a single parent, but I don't know. Um, I became a single parent when my daughter was 11 months old. We were living um we were living overseas. She'd been born in Gran Canaria, where my husband and I, my husband and I had had um, a dive centre. We literally closed the doors on the dive centre on Friday, the 29th of August. And my daughter was born Saturday, the 30th of August. Um, so we had all this turmoil of losing our business getting kind of having people come in and pick over the bones of our business and saying, yes, I'll take those tanks. No, I won't take that falling apart neoprene. And then three months after that, kind of in the November time, um, we then left the island. So this is in 2008, at the beginning of the recession, the global recession. So we left the island with a baby, a cat we'd managed to adopt as well. Um, our luggage, basically, and I think a guitar, maybe, don't know. Um, and then had some few sessions shipped over back to us. Um, and we moved in with my husband's parents in the French Alps, which was a big change from sunny Gran Canaria to snowy the Alps. And then after that, as things happen under great stress, our relationship imploded and I became a single mother. Um, when my daughter was 11 months old, when she was 12 months old, we came back to the UK. So that was quite a busy year, <laughs> a lot of change. Um, and my, my daughter's husband continues to live overseas. And, um, and so for me, it felt very much as if from the outset, from the moment that we separated and I said, Previous to the separation, you do realise that I will go back to England, that my that I will take my daughter back to England because that's my home. Um, from that point of coming back here, having to find somewhere to live, um, deal with the benefit system, negotiate all of that, and build a life completely from scratch all over again. I've just never. I suppose I've never felt I've had the luxury to second guess myself. So I've never felt guilty because I've always been sure, if that makes sense. That's so cool because what I'm hearing in that is not buying into an expectation that just because you are a mum, that somehow guilt has to come with that package. I remember um, when I first had my son, Leo, and you know, I felt enormous amount of guilt when I was working and he was with someone else, you know, where he was with being looked after by someone else. And it really looked to me like the guilt was coming from um, her and, and spending time with him. And um, this carried on for a little while uh, until I was at a seminar and I was in the UK and... I had sent, been sent a photo by his nanny at the time and his and her boyfriend and they were playing on the beach and Leo was with them and I was like, oh, you know, that should be me and oh, I'm such a bad mom and blah, 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 blah. And then I was listening to a recording and what I heard in that recording is all you need to do is bring that feeling of who you are back home. And suddenly all the guilt that I was feeling just vanished. It just faded away. And what I realized was, is that there were so many expectations that I had put on myself about what being a mom is. And that, of course, you know, if you're a mother, you, you feel guilt because mm. everybody else does. Um, but then I realized that who I really am isn't a mom. It's just a role I play. And, and, and that that role doesn't need to come with the guilt package because just because everybody else is doing it it doesn't mean we need to yeah no i mean you're always a parent but you're not always parenting <laughs> you get to do other things you know and i think it's uh, uh, perhaps again having a sing being 
the single grown up in the house, having a being the person, only having one only having kind of one overview, not having to have, not having to negotiate with another grown up um, about what's going on. You know, again, that removes the second guessing because I've got one overview. I see our little world, um, and that's I'm very clear about what I need the things that I need to to do for my work. I run my own business now because, you know, being in charge of everything isn't enough. I have to be in charge of everything and my own business. Um, that, that sense that actually I know where we're going, so the decisions I make will take us there. And the kind of that 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 guilt of miss of oh I'm missing out or my child's having a lovely time with somebody else. I should be it should be me having the lovely time with them. I think that, you know, it's actually now my child should be having a lovely time with other people and that's enriching their their experience. They're learning how to have fun without me and how to be their own person without me. And I'm off doing whatever it is I have to do, work or some, you know something fun for me and you know because your child spends time with uh, in childcare, learning and having different experiences you know when I my child first went into childcare, I didn't drive so I knew that the child minded would take my child out to have experiences that I couldn't give them because I couldn't get that literally couldn't take them to the same places in the same way um so I think that I think some of that guilt comes from the you like you were saying that kind of own as if you should only have one role and that as a mother you should it should all be tied up with your child rather than saying actually I get to make choices for my child's benefit that that mean I'm not involved that means they go and have like when they go and have fun at their friend's house you don't feel guilty because your child's gone to see its pal so why should you feel guilty that they're with a child minder learning different things, having different experiences or that, you know, grandma or grandpa is looking after them. So you, you can go and do something else for work or whatever else it is. You know, I think it's a really narrow expectation. I love that Ruth. It's so true. And I have seen this time and time again, my son is now, well, my, my partner and I are no longer together. And he's now, he's, he's actually now going off to the US to be, well, he's with his dad at the moment. And, um, you know, we, we, we lead a very unconventional life in that we don't have 2.4 children. Um, you know, we've got one son and he lives in the States and I live here in Spain and, so now we're just in the unknown most of the time going, what, what, what are we to do? Cause we want to spend time with him and, and we want it to be fairly 50, 15 and fairly equal. So we're just winging it in the moment of like making decisions that are seem right for, for, for our, for our son. And what I've found is that the less guilt that I've got, going on, which I really don't actually spend much time in at all. Um, it's easier for me to make better decisions because I'm not constantly being beholden to this feeling. So like, I don't know if, if there was the guilt, then you'd want to possibly buy them lots of presents to make up for the fact that you're not around or you would compensate in a way that isn't necessarily the best thing for, for the child or even for you. No, and I think as well, if you're doing that compensating, you're giving you're giving a message to your child or your children that somehow, because you've got to go and because some a decision perhaps is uncomfortable, or, um, or you know, or just isn't as much fun, you know, the we can't do that because well we haven't got enough in savings, or we can't do that because mummy has to work. That somehow because because you're making a decision or a rat and it's not, it's not all kind of puppies and rainbows that somehow they have to have a compensation for that, that there's an expectation that life shouldn't have discomfort in it. And I don't think we're doing our children any favors with that because life does have discomfort and, you know, acknowledging that 
I know it's a bit rubbish that I can't, we can't go away that weekend because mummy's got to go and work or we haven't got the savings this month or whatever it is that you've got to do that means it's not as much fun as you might hope. Then they've just kind of got to learn about that. You've got to give them the resources to go to shrug it off and mm. go, huh, well, that's all part of life. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I really like your take on this because as parents, we often think that, you know, we have to appease the children um, and make it all nice and, and, and appease. So I guess, you know, guilt, the feeling of guilt is really saying, I, I feel like I've done something wrong, either to, you know, towards someone, um, to someone else, or that I'm not doing something right for them. And that somehow that's having a detrimental effect on their behavior or detrimental effect on their, their well-being. And over time, what I've got to see is that our feelings and thinking are the same thing. So like the way I feel is what I'm thinking in the moment, but nothing outside of me can give me a feeling. So if that's the case, then attempting to appease or attempting to make someone else happy is, is like the dog that needs to catch its tail because that's, that will never happen. They'll have, your children will have the experience that they have regardless of what you do. Even if you appease them, they may, they may totally not see that. Right. <laughs> so I was talking. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's also important for the, for children to learn that they're important in the family, but so is everybody else. But even in our small, in, even in our family of two, yes, you know, especially when they're very little, they need a lot more care because they can't care for themselves. But my child isn't, you know, she's not, I'm still the boss and she has, she has, you know, she has equity and there's an equality there, but she's not more important than me. I have to choose things that sometimes that she, that go against her wishes because actually I have to look at the, you know, the family, the two of us, what's best for the two of us, what's best for the family. She's not the only person to consider. I have to consider and, and we were actually talking about this this weekend. We were discussing something that's happening for her. She wants, it's just, you know, um, uh, some time that she needs to spend with a friend and whether that's going to be an after-school thing or a lunchtime thing. And me, and me, her wanting it lunchtime, me saying, well, actually, I think after, after school is better on this day because, and this is why, and it's actually going to be more convenient for me as well. So, I've heard what you've had to say and what your preference is, but for the whole family, for both of us, I'm going to choose a different option. And that for her, that understanding that she's important, but it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean that everything goes her way. So what I hear in this is boundaries too, right? So absolutely, there's a sense of self of like actually needing to learn the child, needing to learn that they also have boundaries that sometimes because I guess our kids model us. So in just what you're sharing, it's kind of saying, well, you have the capacity to also make decisions that are right for you in the long run. Um, but here's, here's a win-win for both of us. Yes, you can. And yeah. it's also going to work for me too. Yeah, exactly. And I don't, you know, where you've got, of course, um, my child, you know, the decisions I make in my in the family, you know, a huge amount of them are absolutely child centric. They have Isabel at the centre of them. They're all about her well being, trying to get the best thing for her. But then there are other things that are actually about what's my well being, what am I trying to achieve, what am I trying to achieve with my business, and the outcome of those. Hopefully, if they all go along and, and succeed, the outcome will be that I can provide greater well being for Isabel. But you know, they have to happen. Those decisions have to be made about what's most effective for the business. Um, and how, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to feel guilty about having to go away for a weekend because that needs to happen. Doesn't mean I don't, I won't miss my child, 
but I'm not going to feel guilty about it because what is what's wrong in that scenario saying I have to go away to work to build my business and that means that if I can build my business get more clients and more money that we're in a more secure situation further down the line and that's that's better for my child I don't think there's you know that keeping uh, keeping your child you know making sure the child's considered or your family's considered, but also recognizing again, what those boundaries are of where that consideration has to stop and a different consideration start. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course. You know, it's interesting. Um, my ex and I were having a conversation about what the next steps would be with regards to our son because uh, at some point he's going to have to go to school full time. And right now uh, we've been doing one month off, one month on. And every time we approach the subject, I would get the, oh, he's coming to the States. I want him educated there. And all I could see was that this was pretty lose-lose all round. Like, well, if that means you want him over there, that means he's not here at all, which basically means that, I'm going to be just visiting mother and I don't want that. So no, I want him to stay here. And we both, you know, dug our heels in. And then my ex had an epiphany about where his decision-making was coming from. So that decision about wanting his son to be in the States and be educated there was all a matter of ego. It wasn't coming from thinking about the other person it was coming from that's what I want for me and that's it and what was really interesting about this Ruth was that we he then came back to the to to Spain and we had a coffee and we started chatting and and the conversation came out again which is you know what are we going to be doing in the next year with Leo and and what what are our plans around that and he basically said look I had an insight. I had a bit of an epiphany with regards to us and Leo. And what I saw was that my decision-making about him coming to be schooled here was very much ego-based. And if I don't want him to be away from me, then you don't want him to be away from you. So who am I to take him away from his mother? And what happened as a result is that that opened up a whole new dialogue of win, win, win for all of us. And there's a really big difference between I'm doing this for me, coming from that ego, this is what is actually right for me, but I'm not taking into consideration what is right for you or what what you might like. Um to actually, this works for me, this works for you. Um, you get what you want, I get what I want. And yeah, it's a win-win. It's maybe not in the same form that you wanted it in, but you still get what you want. Yeah, it is. I think having those, you know, being open to those conversations is important, isn't it? And being able to, and having time to reflect back about those questions of why am I making this decision? It's always going to be helpful when you're, you know, when you're looking at those difficult, (laughs) difficult solutions to find. But it sounds to me, Ruth, that, that because you don't have guilt sitting in the conversation, that it's easier to connect with your daughter in that way and make decisions without the the insecurity, yeah. which make it a hell yeah. of a lot easier, right? Yes. And I don't, again, I'm, you know, sitting here thinking, why don't I feel guilty about stuff? <laughs> feeling guilty about not feeling guilty. <laughs> um, no, don't go there. Don't go yay, there. <laughs> yay. I can join the guilt gang. <laughs> and I think, and again, I, I don't know that, I don't, I'd have to spend a bit more time pondering this and trying to think further back, but 
I certainly think the kind literally the logistics of having nothing starting from scratch and feeling almost um as if I had as a single parent on full benefits as if I've you kind of you've got to more than cope you know you have to do there's no room to get almost as if if you make a wrong you know if if you make a wrong decision or a bad decision or if you're not if you can't manage your money or your household or your child you know when you're a single parent on benefits then the kind of that fear of being written off as another you know single mom on benefits the the source of all ills type of thing that actually there's not the luxury of of being able to make a mistake without being judged and I think a part of that I suppose it's bullishness a part of that character is is slightly bullish in that sense of well I don't have to justify my decision making to anybody else because there's me and my daughter and she's thriving um when she, you know, when they're tiny, you know, you know if your child's healthy and happy and thriving, and you know that immediate kind of feedback. I mean, toddlers are just constant, a constant feedback loop, aren't they? That it's all going well or it's not. There's not much you can do. Um, so I think that perhaps that sense of I don't, I just didn't have, I didn't have capacity for guilt. I, you know, it was in kind of. A pretty, I guess, you know, a pretty stressed out state of building this whole new life, and then kind of negotiating, negotiating all this whole new landscape of single parenting in a new country. Admittedly, my own country, but still, you know, what does that all mean? Building a new life, finding things to do, trying not to kind of sink into a pit of despair. <laughs> trying to work it work out a life and I suppose there wasn't the capacity to feel guilty about that because what had I done wrong I mean guilt you feel you should feel guilty if you've done something wrong if you've willfully wronged somebody if you've you know perhaps married the wrong chap and and made some poor business decisions at the beginning of a recession I don't you know it's not great but I'm not going to feel guilty about it because it wasn't all bad and it didn't, you know, it wasn't willfully wronging somebody. So I don't, I don't see where guilt should come into it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know either. That, that's, you know, it's interesting to me because as I said, I don't, I don't, ex- don't do guilt I don't either. do guilt either. Not much anyway, especially towards my son, maybe. No, but it's curious, isn't it, that expectation of, I think it perhaps does go back, the expectation of a woman to feel guilty as a parent isn't, I don't know, I don't, haven't, is is the same, ex, are men expected to feel guilty as parents? I mean, they're expected to completely, you know, they're expected to continue the long hours and not, it's expected that dads miss out on the, all the school shows or whatever, because, they're at work being workers and breadwinners and captains of industry and all of those cliches. And I think those, I think there's perhaps still that hangover, you know, we're hopefully in slightly more enlightened times, but that as a, as a female parent, as a mother, that perhaps it's the expectation that you will only make good decisions for your child. So the, and that we're all still hung up on this notion of mother is care and that there's only one way to mother, which is to be at home with your child. So any decision that you make that's not that, you should feel guilty about because you're not conforming to what the world of stereotypes wants. But that's- and now it's almost become mm-hmm. this thing that women should feel guilty. Mothers should feel guilty. <laughs> Why? What have we done wrong? Yeah, and and what occurred to me when when you were speaking is there's a kind of a um, 
a misconception about what guilt actually is. So I see guilt like worrying. It's a bit like if I feel guilty, and this is totally unconscious, by the way, it's not something we do actively consciously, but if I feel guilty, if I think I've done something wrong and I'm caught up in that story thought storm about guilt, then at least if I'm feeling guilty, I'm not such a bad person. So it's almost like mm. worry. If I'm worrying about someone, it means I care. Yes. Yes, I see. However, that yeah. kind of guilt is an awareness yeah, of wrongdoing totally. as an acknowledgement <laughs> that you've done done something wrong, so you feel guilty, so you can make amends. And yes, make something of those long lines, you know, because there is the society norm which basically says if you're not feeling guilty, it means you you don't care, or it doesn't mean. And and it's the same with worry. And I remember watching. I can't remember where it was, but I heard a really cool story that really put this into perspective for me, which was um, she's a coach who was working with a, a client and she, her client had cancer and they were working together and um, oh, she was a friend of hers. Anyway, they, this lady was usually very, very cool, calm and collected. And her client friend uh, seemed that she was also very cool, calm, collected. And then one day um, her friend turned around and just started sort of getting really worried about her, you know, worried about what's going to happen, worried about the cancer, worried about this, worried about that, worried about the other. And her friend turned around and said, you know, worrying about this doesn't help me at all. Because I know that when you're calm and quiet, that there's nothing for me to worry about. And there was something in what she said that I was like, wow, what I heard in that is that when we are not in the place of worry or guilt, that we're able to be present with someone. And that's mm. actually far more useful and helpful than if we're caught up in our own guilt storms um which basically as far as i can tell have been you know given to us by society of what we need to be how we need to be what we should be doing how we should be behaving as mothers and as parents and you know how it should look based on things that didn't really work out anyway from our you know from our parents generation um yeah. So that's what I hear in your story, Ruth. I hear that being present and not having guilt in the way allows for there to be far better connection, but also creative ideas and solutions that can actually really benefit both parties. I hope so. <laughs> um, I try. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think I think listening to you talk then that kind of um kind of thinking over some of the things we've just been talking about, I think that, you know being guilty doesn't feeling guilty about something doesn't always allow you space to acknowledge a mistake. Mm. You know, I lost my temper yesterday with my daughter and she was having a particularly epic meltdown about something. And, um, you know, I got cross and was cross at her and um, knew it, it wouldn't help at all resolve the situation, but I kind of got to the end of my bit of patience there. <laughs> You're very PC. And I was cross. I was cross. And, uh, you know, and then she, and off she stomped. <laughs> and um, fortunately, none of the doors in our house can slam very well. It's a very old house, very wonky <laughs> doors, so none of the doors slam. So we escaped the doors slamming, um, at least. But um, I think if she could have slammed doors, she would have slammed them. And, you know, and afterwards, I don't know, I, afterwards, I just, you know, when we were both less grumpy, you know, I said... Sorry, sorry for being cross at you. And I think if you're sometimes if or if you're doing that 
guilty and appeasing that we were talking about earlier, that kind of giving of gifts, overcompensating, that doesn't leave you room to just acknowledge that you were, you made a mistake and you were, you know, or you could have been, you know, you could have tried harder not to get cross. (laughs) It doesn't, it doesn't leave room for that kind of acknowledgement of and that a more, a more human kind of approach to emotions of yeah you're allowed to get cross at something try not to be mean when you're cross you know but I'm not going to feel massively guilty for getting cross at her maybe you know maybe I think that you know enough of a twinge of guilt to think oh I could have I could have handled that better but you know there'll be another day when she's having a meltdown and a grump and I'll have listened to it enough <laughs> and have got fed up of listening and will snap back at her. But, you know, I think being able, having the room there to be able to say, yeah, I didn't do very well with her today, did I, is, is much better than kind of the over-appeasing of guilt of, oh, I'm so sorry, and that kind of outpouring of guilt of, because that's not very, you know, they're not seeing their own part in the dynamic. I think if you're just saying, I'm so sorry and I'm a terrible person and I feel so guilty and I feel so bad, that then becomes all about your feelings rather than just saying, I didn't do very well. I wasn't very patient, but I got a bit fed up to you <laughs> listening to you thump around the house. Thanks. But it also, you know, going back to what you said, yeah, it, yeah. it is the humanness in it all. And we are human beings and, you know, we have, we do experience emotions and we do experience feelings and we do experience those moments. I, I call them thought storms that come in and out. And, and, and then when the, when the dust settles kind of thing, you're able to see with more clarity and communicate with more clarity. And there's something, yeah. there's, there's something that our children can really see in that, which gives them permission to also have those moments too because to not have them and to avoid them and to it's almost like saying I don't want to feel those things because they're wrong and what I'm hearing you say is that I feel them and sometimes I express them but maybe not in the best way I know I've had some corkers with Leo where I've just (laughs) I've just got to the edge and just gone way beyond it. You know, kids, but then, yeah, kids need to, to know that, you know, I think it's a rare parent that can, <laughs> can keep their keep their cool and never get to the edge of it, to the limit of it. You know, I do try and give a fair warning. <laughs> Mummy's patience isn't, you know, especially if, if I might have had a gin cocktail the night before or kind of not much sleep or overtired or something, I quite often I'll be... You know, mum is pretty tired today. So if we could try not to have any grumps between us, that would be great. Or my patience isn't very long today. Or if she's, you know, in mid turmoil, then I'm usually like, get a bit grumpy in your room. I don't want to listen to it. Thanks. <laughs> you know, because if you break something, go in your own room, stop about and break things. Because if you break it, anything in another room, I will be quite cross about that. And, you know, that's your fair warning that I'm. I'm I'm hearing your turmoil. I don't want to deal with it though. But yeah, they have to. Your kids have to know that you've got a limit, and that sometimes you reach it. Because otherwise, when do they? What do they learn about their own behaviour if you if you let it all just wash over you? It's not. How will they learn to moderate their behaviour if they don't realise that there's there's an impact on what they do? But from also. What they do? they also learn where their boundaries are and where their limits are because they have them too. And that's very healthy. Like I've, you know, one of the things that um, one of my coaches and I have talked about before is because when I wasn't seeing it so clearly, like when I was feeling really guilty about those moments that I kind of came to the edge, um, I, I would then go and beat myself up about it for a while. And over time, I realized that that wasn't really helping anybody. And what I've got to see over time is that actually 
what's really useful for Leo is for me to come back to him and say, hey, I'm sorry, a bit like, you know, what you've been saying, but also for him to see, yes, I go into those thought storms, but then I, my recuperation period is quite short. So we're back, we're back to center again, you know, not long after. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's modeling that emotional regulation that it takes you longer to get to your breaking <laughs> point and you're able to yeah. kind of ping back from it than, you know, you know, from settle to turmoil is a fairly short journey when you're only nine and a half. <laughs> Um, so and then the turmoil is quite a long part of the journey, it seems. Um, you know, she's learning. It's, she's getting those preteen hormones Yay. as well. But she's also Yay. got something great to model it off. That's what I'm saying Yay. is that. Yeah. But you have to, you know, I think there, I think you're right. It is that, you know, got to show that you've got your own break. You know, you've, you've got your patience, but then it's, it ends and you get cross and then you ping back that bit quicker, but it ha you know, you're, you're modeling that regulation, aren't you? Because there's something to be said actually. for compassion. Like I, you know, the, the whole beating ourselves up about a behavior that we've exhibited and, and, and then beating ourselves up about it, which basically that's what guilt is, right? The beating ourselves up about something that we've done, which actually is totally innocent from what I can gather. And nobody, I mean, I say nobody, but anybody in their right mind doesn't go out intentionally to hurt other people. It's not something we intentionally go and do. And unless, of course, you know, you're not in your right mind. But for the most, the majority, um, and I'm, I'm assuming that also for those that are listening in, you know, we don't do things with intent to go, I'm going to go and hurt you or, you know, you go, don't go and intentionally go and hurt your child. That's just not something that I, most mothers I speak to just don't go and intentionally hurt their children. Um, so it's never done with malice. It's just moments that we are in that we're human and to be compassion, you know, bring that, that compassion towards ourselves and kindness. Yeah, I think it's, you know, you hit nail on the head. It's having compassion towards yourself and saying, okay, you know, if you've had to make a decision that you don't particularly want to make or, you know, if you've had to work and miss something, you know, it's saying, well, what were the other thing? You know, what were the choices you made? You know, was it a bit, bit of a no-win situation? Did you make the best choice? Or why did you? It's knowing. I think it's giving yourself that compassion of understanding why you've made your choices and being happy with that. And I think that's, you know, I'm happy with the choices I make, so I don't feel guilty about them. So maybe that's it. Being sure being sure in your decision-making and acknowledging that actually, well, you know, should you take a job or should you say freelance? Well, I'll take the job. Yes, but taking the job means that you're going to, daughter has to be in childcare three nights a week, you're working three long days, but she still has you two evenings in the weekend, but it's more, you know, all those things, all that sitting down and doing the pros and cons of a situation and being sure when you make the decision that, you're being sure of your decision making and also acknowledging that you know what we can try it and if it doesn't work we'll, we'll make a change and it doesn't have to hang you know it's not there are very few things in everyday life that are you know that can't be changed that are you know immovable they might it might be awkward it might be costly in time or money but there's few things that you can't say well that that didn't work, did it? Well, we tried it. <laughs> Let's try something else next. And again, that kind of being able to look back on a decision that perhaps hasn't gone very well, an outcome that's is not worked out, and go, right, well, we tried it. 
that didn't work out. But I know why I made the decisions and I made them in good faith and I was happy with making the decisions. And I've, I've just had this in the last 12 months. Um, you know, I made a decision 12 months ago, which 12 months down the line turned out to, to it didn't work out. And I know the reasons why I took the decision, which were all positive ones. I know why it didn't work out, which was a bit of me, a bit of the other person. It was a work situation and a bit of the world outside of us. And I changed that, you know, I can look back at it and go, oh, it was <laughs> looking back, I might have done things differently, but I, but I know why I made those choices and I'm okay with that as awkward and as difficult as that might have been. Um, and I think that again, giving yourself that, that's about compassion saying, have you, have you made your, not have you made a good decision, but have you made a decision well? Yeah. And I, you know, go, go back to this because what's come to me as we're speaking is I really want my son to, to be compassionate and kind towards himself. That's what I'd love for, for Leo because I know how difficult it is when we're not. And I would want him to experience that more of the time. And if that's the case, then there's, there's, there's room for me to be more in that place as well, i.e. kind and, and compassionate towards myself, even for the weird and wonderful behaviors that I, that I express. And so there's room for that kindness and compassion to come in when we've, when we've experienced, you know, not our best behavior per se, they're not the behavior that we pers would like to demonstrate, but what's more powerful is the kindness and compassion that can come with that. And that that can be seen and illustrated, you know, seen and experienced by our children. Yes. And I think there's, there's something I'm trying to kind of think about it, you know, where we hold on to guilt, where if you've made, if something's happened and you feel guilty about it and you feel bad about it and you hold on to that, you're not really holding on to the outcome of the, the decision or the outcome of the problem or whatever it was. You're holding on to some small emotional drama for yourself. That's, that's mm. about you, not about, actual outcomes you know if you miss your child's school performance the child will be sad you'll have the conversation about it but if you hold on to that guilt the child isn't isn't well hopefully they're not going to continue to bring it up until they get married and can shame you publicly um in their speech at their wedding they're missing <laughs> their year two nativity or whatever it was and they played a lobster um but <laughs> But if you hold on to it, if you hold, what's how's that serving you as a as a grown up? How's that serving you as a parent to keep? From, oh, I was a terrible person because I missed the year two lobster nativity, and you're still holding on to that weeks, months, years down the line. It's like, no, you're not a terrible person. You're a busy person, or you're someone a working person, but <laughs> missing. Missing your child's activity is it's sad, but it's not doesn't make you a terrible person. So I think holding on to that guilt is it's self-serving in a rather negative way. She said mm. slightly judgily. Um yeah. she's thinking about <laughs> anyone that's listening to this going, Oh, I do that. Oh, she thinks I'm a terrible person. I don't know. You know <laughs> sorry, I don't mean to make anyone feel guilty. Um <laughs> <laughs> but you, I think there is that. It's, I think perhaps a better way to word it is you're holding on to an, some kind of emotional content for you that's, that is somehow holding on to that negative, all that negative feeling around and building up to all that guiltiness of, oh, I'm a terrible person. Or, Why did I do that? Why did oh, all that discomfort, all that internal stuff is it's serving you it must be serving you in some way but not in a positive way what's i would question you know i hope people can reflect and think 
why, what do I get out of that? What do I get out of that kind of continually putting myself down or telling myself off? What's, where's that come from? And what's that about? And it's not really serving me because if everyone's, you know, got past the fact you forgot to buy loo roll this week and someone's gone to the corner shop and bought some, um, it, and you're still holding on to that internal drama about being the worst mother ever because you forgot to put Lou roll on the shopping list as I did this week. Um, but, you know, if that's an internal dialogue you have to have, what's, who's that serving? Cause everyone's moved on and you haven't. So coming back to, you know, guilt-free living, which this podcast was about, what are you doing more of in your life that, that, lights up your you know lights up your heart lights up your uh, soul what am i doing more of um i'm running twice a week with my friend i run twice a week with her cool. she's just so that's for both of us she came to me and went do you want to run in the morning i'm like okay then so we do that twice a week and i go to um i go to ballet class i'm learning point work Yes. Oh, so wow. I, I trained, That's I did awesome. ballet from ages six to nine and then did gymnastics and um, contemporary. And I trained as a contemporary dancer for my degree. But that was a very long time ago. And I've never done point work. And it was one of those things that is kind of contemporary dancers slightly sniffy about work, kind of the patriarchy and the hierarchy and the British tiny shoes and it's all terrible and conforming and girl you know but it's all terribly patriarchal ballet puffed very not very feminist <laughs> and having been very sniffy about it in my 20s in my 40s I went oh I'd quite like to give it a go though um so about a year ago I started I bought my first pair of point shoes which are now called torture shoes and every week I go and do danger toes um so I do that, and yeah. the next oldest person in the class is in her 20s. I think the youngest is from school. Oh, wow, yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> and, and I've got to be in the school show as well. So, so I'm going to be in the same – my daughter's dance school, so I'll be in the dance show with my daughter. You won't be in the same dance Oh, that's so, so I'm doing awesome. point work, which is uh, really painful, um, but I love it. So I have like that hour and 15 minutes of not not thinking about anything else. It's just for me. And so I go and don't feel guilty about it. Don't feel guilty about the fact we have to have a late supper <laughs> and it's usually bathe food from the freezer. <laughs> That's just good meal planning. Um, yeah, I do stuff like that. I do fun stuff. Have fun. Yeah, what I really hear from what you're saying actually is that there's freedom, freedom to do what you want freedom to work the way you want and freedom to bring up your daughter the way you want. Yeah, I think because you're not being beholden yeah. to this feeling that constantly would have you make those decisions like not go and do the yeah, point work I mean, because you have to be with your daughter or have, you know and 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 reduce the the quality of life I guess yeah, that you're you know, experiencing as a result. We're on a, we're on a pretty tight ship, you know, it's tricky times money wise at the minute with them. <laughs> But you make your choices within that. You see, you know, what are the limits and you make, you know, you have to make choices. And I was thinking the other week, oh, maybe I should give up my point class because can I really afford it? And it's like, well, can you afford not to have, you know, an hour and a half of something that's just for you in the week? Mm. You know, I think that's, you should have that luxury. And, you know, with, with work, it's acknowledging that I keep, you know, my work hours, uh, 9 30 to 3 30 you know the hours of the school run so that's it I now acknowledge that my business will grow more slowly I it means it will have an impact on us financially for a while until you know next year hopefully I won't be doing the school you know I won't be doing the walk to and from school so I'll you know eke out extra bits of time in the day and then when she goes off to high school she'll you know not want to speak to me at all in daylight hours so 
that's fine. I can be a workaholic again. Um, but it's, it's acknowledging, I think it's, again, it's acknowledging that if there are limits or if I choose, if I want to be here in the evenings and take my daughter to her evening classes or be around on the nights when, she, you know, and just have nights when it's just us, that that means that it means that it's going to have an impact on my work. And the outcome of that is that, we might be a bit skint for a bit longer, but actually what we want as a family, that's, that's, I'm okay with that offset. I'm not going to feel guilty about it because it's a decision we're making as a family. Yeah. Yeah. Totally hear that. So Ruth, thank you so much for coming on here today. Now, um, we didn't really talk about your business. We, we were just talking okay. about obviously the guilt side of things, but if someone does want to contact you, um, yes. because they feel they, they resonate with sure. your message or essentially what we've been speaking about today. And they want to know a little bit more about how, what you are, what you're up to, how can they? Um, they can email me. It's Ruth at imp, which is imp dash ideas.com. And I, it's my business is, um, a marketing business. So it's marketing and, social media and a lot of looking at kind of how we build community for your business so that you're, you know, you're not shouting into the void on social media, but that you're, you're building a community and also again, looking at time management. So you're not kind of feeling guilty about sitting down and doing a bit of social media or, you know, you're not letting things over trying to not feel guilty and overwhelmed by stuff, but trying to be very realistic about actually what time have you got in the week how are you going to get the things you need to get done, done? So a little bit of social media, a little bit of marketing, a little bit of systems and admin and kind of, again, putting it in that kind of holistic framework of actually what, what time have you got? What do you want to achieve? What's realistic? Don't feel guilty. <laughs> a bit Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop feeling guilty. Stop, Stop it. Feeling guilty. And they can they, if they want to noodle about on social media with me. I'd welcome them. Uh, I think I'm on Instagram and Twitter is at um, hello in Pideas. I like what I did there. And or if they want the more sweary version, they can just look for the Ruth Douglas. And there's a slightly small, more sweary version of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, version. Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having for coming on here today. Enjoy. <laughs> and there you have it. Another wonderful episode of The Joy of Being. If you loved what you heard here today and it's been helpful, why not subscribe or share the podcast with others? And if you're curious as to how you can experience more joy in your life and feel carefree, then I invite you to download your Joy Catalyst Scorecard at www.marinapearson.com slash scorecard, which will help you identify the joy gaps and what you can do to fill them. And remember, you can find me on Instagram at Marina Pearson or my Facebook group, The Joy of Being. So until next week's episode, remember, you are the joy you seek.